Hey everyone, uh, it's KJ again. Remember how last episode I said that uh, we had some audio issues and we were going to get that cleared up in future episodes? Well, we're in the future now, and the audio issues that we had in the last episode are not the same ones we had in this episode. So the good news is we failed differently. The bad news is the audio still isn't perfect. Uh, so sorry about that. You'll hear some good audio, and then you'll hear some weird audio, and then you'll hear some Zoom audio. Uh, so just wanted to let you know that's how the sections break down. Anyways, it's a really, really great episode, so here it is right now. All right, clap. You don't need and to clap. I, know, I, was, just, I was just, thing, so I was you just getting ready. I was just oh, getting ready was to go just in. your mental, like, just championing yourself. <laughs> here we go. You're listening to The John Chi Show. Hosted by three Korean-American adoptees diving headfirst into what it means to be adopted, Korean, American, and more. And now, here's your hosts, Nathan, Patrick, and KJ. Welcome to the John Chi Show. Welcome back. This is episode 14. We are the John Chi Show. I am Nathan Nowak with your hosts, KJ and Patrick. What does that mean that you're not a host? co-hosts kj <laughs> and patrick oh shoot I'm, I'm like gaining out i need to calm my mic down you keep going kj's full of gain <laughs> he's, he's fully gained he's fully gained up he's the gainer of the crew the full gainer <laughs> is this what is this what the people come for i don't it is. know it's what, hear us talk about skateboarding why is or, or everyone wait, is coming skateboarding? back we would love to know why everyone's coming back we are thankful for everyone coming back though so <laughs> I'm not complaining, but uh, hey, Patrick, what does John Chi show mean? And John Chi. <laughs> and show. John Chi show is the reason that the people come back. I'm almost 100% positive. Mm, I took a poll okay. uh, in my own mind, and everyone responded with that one. 100% reason. of respondents. Yeah. Said. <laughs> <laughs> they said that's why we're coming back. Um, John Chi means celebration, feast, uh, means a coming together of of family uh, to, to celebrate our lives and to, to chat with each other and catch up. Um, and that's what we do here on the show. Uh, show means the way that we present the John Chi to our audience. So that's how I'm defining show. I think we talked about a little bit before uh, we talked to our guests on this episode about how we've never met, actually met each other <laughs> in person yet. We've done all of this um, over Zoom. Which 14 is episodes, kind of funny. never met. Never met. Hilarious. And we never will. So <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> and it's funny, it's funny because that's where we find ourselves in November, which is National <laughs> Adoptee Awareness Month. Um, connecting and doing being being a John doing a John Chi, but virtually. And us coming together every week to hang out, to catch up. To sometimes party, it just really depends when when we're gonna do an actual party. But uh, I think that's been pretty cool. And what's been really cool is us learning a lot of new stuff this month too. Um, I've been talking a lot about adopted territory by Elena J Kim. Elena J Kim. <laughs> Dang it, uh, Patrick! I messed so it up strong. again. Start wow. Over. Elena J Kim. And I know that we're trying to dive in a little bit more on cultural stuff and to just learn a lot more about the adoptee culture um, and not just, you know, the American parts, the Korean parts of the things that we're trying to learn. Uh, KJ was just talking about something that he had just finished up reading. Um, what was that book? What, what did you just get done with? So uh, I just I've been blowing through books lately because uh, they've all been short. And by blowing through short books, I mean listening to them at sped up speed. On not Audible. just like blowing on the pages. Uh, like, not just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or something. Okay, because that's what I would be doing. If I was blowing yep. through the books. I just yep. blow. Thanks, yeah. Dad. <laughs> You're welcome. Just throwing that one out there. <laughs> <laughs> that Patrick. one really got Patrick. Oh, Patrick is dying. Right that, was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I just finished two books. One of them was called When My Name Was Kyoko. Kyoko? Kyoko. <laughs> I'm going to say Kyoko. But uh, if you haven't noticed, we are horrible at pronouncing things on the show. Here's the deal. So it's this it's a historical fiction book written by Linda Sue Park, and uh, it's about korea during japanese occupation from you know 1910 to post-world war ii 
uh, and it was really good. It uh, follows a story of a sister and brother um, who are maybe a couple years apart, uh, and just uh, what that was like. And I was so excited to to listen to that because it really opened my eyes about um, kind of the um, the mindset of what it would be like to be growing up in Korea and under Japanese occupation and maybe give me some sense of why uh, there's so much animosity even to this day between the two nations. Um, so I just feel like I, I got a better sense of uh, historical Korea, you know, um, yeah, no, I'm sure that's very interesting stuff. I mean, the, the fact that, that, uh, I didn't really know about all the, the Japanese influence in Korea until all of the, the stuff that we've talked about and learned from other people. And, uh, even after meeting my biological family, they, they even told me that my um, biological mother had lived in, in Japan for a while and that a lot of her cooking was Japanese, uh, based, I guess, and some recipes. So, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, history there for sure. Yeah. It's just been interesting. Like I've, I've caught like little hints about it. Um, like on Hangul day, uh, you know, there was a post that I saw on Instagram that was like, Hangul is the language of uh, rebellion um, because it was illegal to read and write in Hangul during Japanese occupation. And it was just like, like just its history for millennia, basically, hmm. um, was kind of about that. Uh, and then there was a couple of jokes. Uh, there's a, a specifically a joke in a cold open of Kim's Convenience where uh, Mr. Kim was talking about like, martial arts and how Koreans are the best. And they like, but essentially like they learned all of their martial arts after <laughs> studying in Japan. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, we're so much better than the Japanese. And like, like Taekwondo, like, well, that was based on this guy I went to Japan and then he's like, no, no, no. But, but also, yeah. So like, so there's just been little hints about that. Um, so it's just interesting to hear kind of like a, a not, <laughs> a not comedy take on uh, that occupation time and, and what that was like. So also to hear about like a world war two story, um, that wasn't focused on Germany or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of European centric, but was very, uh, Korean centric and Asia set centric, you know, and not for, even from the American point of view, it was really interesting. Yeah. You don't hear much about the, the Asian influence of world war two other than, you know, Pearl Harbor. Um, that was world war two, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes. it was Pearl Harbor <laughs> and then, <laughs> you uh, it, dropping, right? dropping the atomic yes. bombs. And those are but, like uh, the, the main things. You don't really hear about anything else and how like Korea was involved at all. So Yeah, I've been exactly. Curious. So what's something that really stuck out to you that you weren't really prepared to maybe read or that was just kind of like, whoa, and just kind of caught your eye? Um, potential spoilers for the book. Um, so if you haven't read it, don't, you know, just fast forward. Uh, but the family's uncle gets trapped in North Korea. Mm. Um, and... That like, because I mean, 19, you know, 1945 is essentially, it could be my, you know, grandpa, basically, like, it's only right. that far removed. Um, and so to think about, like, again, another weird Korean joke, uh, Korean throwaway culture piece in Gilmore Girls, of all places, um, <laughs> Rory's best friend, whose name escapes me, I'm sure you're yelling at me, but I can't remember her name. Rory's best friend is like, do I dream of a one day of a unified Korean peninsula? Yes. But anyways, and like, like, she just throws that out there and moves on about anyways. Um, so I was like, oh, should I be thinking about a unified peninsula? You know, because I just like... If, as an American, I think of North Korea and South Korea as so different and like so just, you know, just all of that is, is so heavily dictated by my um, American point of view. And then to be like, no, just, you know, a generation ago, there were there were family members who at one point lived in the same house and then for one reason or another got trapped on opposite sides of the border and how uh, disruptive that can be and how, how um, you know, just like, oh, man, now I, you know, we're here we are. And uh, I could see pictures and like not ever know that family member. Um, so that was really eye opening. Um, I was curious. Do you feel like your being adopted was the thing that encouraged you to learn about Korean culture? Because I feel like for me, thinking about being Korean has helped me kind of like reckon with being adopted. But do you think it's the opposite for you? Yeah, I think that was definitely my entry point um, solely because. I think because of being so dismissive of it and just completely going the opposite way of even going after other or other cultures like growing up, um, I think especially starting on this journey, that was 
Well, I guess I can't really say that. I don't necessarily know if it was adoption specific at this point. It was almost just feeling detached from Asian America as a whole. And, yeah. and that was kind of what launched me into these last five months as opposed, not necessarily adoptee, but it was, I did get an article right around that same time of starting that was adoptee focused um, when I had no idea that was a community that, and then that was my entry into that. So it, I don't know. It's it's weird to try and navigate both both communities at the same time because while they are related in some ways, they are very different in others. So I will say one thing that I have noticed in in the exploration and just over time of what we've been doing on this show uh, that I I have changed um, along with the fact of of course connecting with my biological family five years ago is in this last five years I've noticed I've eaten a lot more Korean food. Same than I, than I ever have before. Uh, I mean, I of course you know Korean barbecue. You got a little bit of you know meat and and you know stuff like that. Potatoes, where like, of course. How is yeah? How can you not eat that? But I'm eating like more kimchi or more uh, sundubu. Um, you know, we're buying uh, tofu, spicy tofu soup. Um, it sounded like mm. uh, Zabumafu, which I think you're too old to know, but like <laughs> just sounded like that. The, it's like like PBS programming. It was like a talking monkey. Yeah. No, Anyways, I, I was know, like, I'm oh, sorry, you were eating one. Zabuma food? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, eating tofu you? soup and uh, <laughs> eating, uh, what was the other thing that I, I eat? Oh, uh, kimchi pancakes, scallion pancakes. I mean, the things that I've been buying lately are yeah. a lot more are Korean and Asian oriented. And that's even, you know, after we had our episode uh, um, that, you know, that we are talking about today, the interview today, I actually made kimbap uh, after, nice. after the episode. And uh, it was just, again, I don't know, all these things that, uh, which, by the way, I learned ma- to make kimbap from my brother and his family mm. when they came to visit the, the second time. Uh, so, yeah, the little things that I've been doing over these last five years are more, are definitely more Korean, um, you know, oriented. And it's it's uh, really eye opening. I kind of want to go back to Korea again. Well, of course, I want to go back, but we talked about that in our last episode, but I want to go back now for real real because i feel like i'm going to be a lot more aware and what to look for what to eat um i i know a little bit better what i liked from the last trip so i want to have more of that things like that because it, it was only i was only there for three days so it was a really quick trip oh shoot yeah i didn't so, realize um, it was that short it was three days and it was it was only doing what they took me to so i didn't really have any say in anything so um so but, i feel like it's been established in our canon that nathan you are the resident foodie. I feel like you have <laughs> you talk about food a lot, and you obviously are <clears throat> love to cook and, and do that and explore all of that. Um, I'm wondering, just as as you're talking about getting more involved with Korean foods and like making it and going out and doing that and connecting with it. Your wife is half Chinese and half Japanese, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming, yeah. or I don't want to assume, but. I'm willing to bet that she go like has a lot of those in, a lot of those influences in her <laughs> like cooking and foods that that she like that you guys had had been making together. And then now I was wondering as you went on this journey with Korean food, have you seen that a lot of those influences of other pieces of the culture kind of like permeating to your kids or permeating to your wife? I was just wondering. I just hadn't even thought of that until you had talked about that. You know, making oh, yeah. more of that I'm, food. My kids are ready are way more involved in any Asian food than I was growing up. I mean, you got to assume that because, uh, <laughs> A, I live in California, and B, my wife's influence, like you said. Uh, but, I mean, the fact that my kids well, are... Well, and C, they have two Asian parents. <laughs> and they have two Asian parents, whereas I, yeah, I had two white parents. Although um, <laughs> the accessibility to the these types of foods are, are more abundant. And so I never even saw seaweed, you know nori as a kid but yet my kids eat it like potato chips um you know if they if i don't have anything green on their plate at dinner time and i'm thinking oh what what am i missing here i'll just open a bag of seaweed for them (laughs) my parents would have never said that okay (laughs) does seaweed count as a vegetable (laughs) yeah why not it's got a lot of antioxidants green (laughs) all right great great all right I'm calling it a I'm vegetable. Down for it. I'll have to look that up later. But so yeah, I, I really think that uh, the influence from both sides, um, you know, is is definitely strong. 
Um, I was just going to ask, have you guys tried any fusions of Korean food and then like with any Chinese or Japanese dishes and like just done it up at home like that? Besides the one that I talked about in uh, the MB Asians episode, which was the Kogi truck fusion Korean tacos. Um, I, I definitely have, have eaten those a lot. Uh, there's actually a Korean owned breakfast shop that my wife and I used to go to uh, in Culver City that had kimchi oh sorry no bulgogi omelets which was amazing and uh i don't know why that's not a thing in more places i guess you have to have the bulgogi <laughs> but that bulgogi omelet there was was is yeah that i feel is a fusion breakfast item for sure yeah so i've had uh la burger which is real good that would be like korean american fusion uh it's like i think they have a bulgogi burger with probably kimchi on it um Korean food is surprisingly popular in Springfield. They're Korean flavors. Mm. So uh, there's a, a what once was a food truck and now has their own building place here in town called Scully's. Uh, it's a ramen shop. And so you can go um, and get ramen or wok bowls and you can add like kimchi. And then they have kimchi fries with cottage cheese. It's like a weird... Uh, Interesting. Wait, it's not, not cottage cheese. Cotilla cheese? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's got some mac kind of, and cheese? No, yeah, cojita. Yeah, yeah, crumbled yeah. like little white crumbles. Oh. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like this weird, just like here are all the flavors that we like, and now they're on fries, you know. <laughs> so, um, oh, yeah, I realize that's very different. Um, yeah. anyways, so yeah, so th we've had like the most fusiony I get is when I make kimchi fried rice and I scramble my eggs. I'll add some everything but the bagel seasoning to it. <laughs> mm, Trader um, Joe's. You have Trader yeah. Joe's out there? No, we oh, no Trader go Joe's. there and stock up as much as we can until the next time that we go to, so oh, okay. we'll, nice. we'll check out with like six of those things of <laughs> everything but the yeah. bagels. These things like, are, are awesome. you okay? Like it's so much cheaper this way. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah. So there are lots of Korean influences here in town, which is cool. Uh, just cause I get to, um, I only eat it in fusion styles. I don't really get the opportunity to eat many authentic quote unquote, uh, Korean places. I'm not sure that I would know, authentic if it slapped me in the face but um yeah if you can't read the menu maybe <laughs> no because i could well yeah i you guess you probably I, could read yeah. the menu i mean i could i wouldn't know what i was saying i'd be like this, <laughs> this is zaboomafu <laughs> am i about to eat am i about to I, eat a monkey i, I, I dare you to yes. go to a korean restaurant and order that <laughs> uh, yo yo this is <laughs> my, yeah <laughs> my friend said to order the zaboomafu <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and you've been left out of the restaurant. Okay. Well, okay. we should move to the interview. Yes. Um, so today we had a, a really great opportunity. We sat down with the co-founders of Nunchi Company. Um, and this is our first time to have two people on the show. It's a husband and wife duo. It is Te Adaman and Nuri Ali. Uh, it was so, so great to, to sit down with them. They started Nunchi Co. as a means of honoring, inspiring, and celebrating the diverse lives of Asian Americans through storytelling. Uh, so Nunchi, we get into it in the episode, but they, it's like a like a BuzzFeed for Asian American content. Um, and Nunchi is a Korean term, which we, uh, it's kind of hard to nail down um, the definition for. But that was a really great conversation. So uh, here is the interview right now. Roll wow. clip. Wow. 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 All right, we are here with Tajin Adderman and Nori Ali. Thank you guys for coming. How are you guys doing today? Good, thanks for having us. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. Yeah, you too. Um, they are the founders of Nunchi Company, and we're going to get into that. Um, that is how we found them and uh, how we've been interacting, and we're really grateful for them to come on the show. Uh, thank you guys so much for giving us the opportunity and giving us a little bit of quick turnaround uh, from getting this scheduled. So I know it's not always easy in 2020 but here we are in our living rooms doing this podcast so um we start the shows the same way we always ask about adoption stories and since we have two of you here um i want to start with you tay uh kind of give us a little bit about your background and your adoption story and then we'll go to nori and we'll go from there yeah uh, no thanks for having us again um so my name is tay i was adopted at six months old um, from south korea in uh, Daegu, it was Daegu, Tegu with a T. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but and they, they, they changed the so transliteration. <laughs> yeah, and now it's Daegu. Um, so 
sometimes like my official documents, sometimes I get nervous. I feel like, are you really from this city? Were you really born here? It's like, well, it's not on the map anymore, but um, I, was, I was adopted. I promise it's a real old. place. Yeah. <laughs> my last name's a German name and they're just super confused. But um, I've, I grew up in Colorado for the first 18 years of my life um, in a very uh, middle-class Christian um, conservative household, very close to my parents. Um, but you know, not, I don't prescribe to some of those beliefs anymore. Um, I went to school, I started school actually in LA at Azusa Pacific university doing army mm. ROTC. Mm. Um, yeah, it was fun, but I realized I didn't want to join the army. So I transferred, I came back to Colorado for a semester, figuring out what I wanted to do. Ended up in Kansas city, Missouri, Hey-o. which is why, yeah, I know that's why I know the nickname <laughs> misery. <laughs> you want to mispronounce the state. <laughs> um, I got wonderful grades in college in Kansas City because there's literally nothing to do there. Um, <laughs> hey, there's worlds of fun. I was like, uh, wow, what yeah, a flex. And I mean, then it's like, oh, okay, no, I get it. I get it. I guess there's like cow tipping, duck hunting. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, nothing against the city. Great barbecue. Um, and then after that, I moved to Chicago for a couple of years with AmeriCorps. So I was living in the inner city, working in the inner city with attorneys um, representing indigent youth, uh, criminal defense, uh, uh, pro bono public interest firm. And then after that, I moved to Washington, D.C., where I um, d- did law school, and that's where I met Nori. Nice. Very cool. Been everywhere. You've actually been to each major like place that one of us has been at some point in our life. I thought that was interesting <laughs> to hear you just hit all the places that we've been. So you went, yeah, yeah. all four time zones: mountain, western, <laughs> central, eastern. Mm-hmm. So there you go. And Nori, how about you? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, coming to America, and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my family is from India. My dad grew up in India. My mom is ethnically Indian, but grew up in Manchester, England. So I was born there. Um, My family moved to the States when I was pretty young. Um, I want to say I was like six months old. So I'm a dual citizen, um, but I spent most of my life in the Northern Virginia area. Um, And yeah, I went to college here. I did nursing school before law school, worked as a nurse for a while. Um, Now I'm a healthcare attorney. And um, yeah, that's where I met Tay. In law school, yeah. Very nice. So you've been, once you got here, you've been in one spot a little bit on the East Coast, and Tay just was like, let me let me get everything else in, and then when we come together, we can just combine <laughs> these experiences. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> and how long have you guys been married? Four years and some change. You, you sure about that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. Kind of blurry, <laughs> And this yeah, technically, this pandemic year has felt like five years yeah. already. Yeah, right? exactly. Like we got so, married yeah. in March of 2020, <laughs> yeah, so 12 years exactly. ago. It's been five years. Very cool. So I guess one of the things I thought was really interesting is you both practice law. And it seems like you both kind of found your ways into that. And I was wondering if you could give our audience a little bit uh, of background on your journeys into that. Uh, I feel like, Tay, you, uh, did you practice law or was that what you went to school for initially and then just kind of fell into it once you got to Chicago or how did that work for you in the, in that journey? Yeah. So I, I major in political science pre-law, which is, I think like one third of most law students, they have that poli sci degree. Um, so I was one of the, one of on, on that track. Uh, so I, I worked in Chicago at a law firm preparing for law school, doing the LSAT, completing that, and then going to law school um, was a natural progression. But I, I will caveat this. I don't know if anyone from the American Bar Association is listening. I'm not technically practicing law, so I can't give legal advice right now. Um, I am barred in D.C., but I'm not. Yeah, no, no free legal advice from me. That's okay. We don't usually. <laughs> or you ask could give for out it, lots but... of legal advice, but it's a, just disclaimer. <laughs> it's all trash, and you should not listen to me. Anyways, here's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> And Nori, I know that, or I saw that you um, were an RN or, or a nurse prior and then till or before becoming like a healthcare lawyer. Uh, what what precipitated that jump or what what prompted you to, to make that move there? Yeah, so um, I had originally gone to nursing school because I was unsure of whether or not I wanted to go to medical school, like <laughs> all other Asian American kids. Um, 
And so when I graduated, I entered into a nursing residency program, which is a program that's meant to help nurses either go to medical school or enter a nurse practitioner program. Um, And I just thought that being in a hospital is so interesting to see structurally all the problems that can arise. Um, And so I just kind of started doing my own research, you know, trying to figure out, you know, why things happen the way they do, how do hospitals get their funding, things like that, Um, and decided to put off applying to grad school for a year. And I worked at a healthcare firm as a paralegal and just kind of fell in love with it. Um, DC is such an interesting place for healthcare because there's a lot of policy work that's done. So I'm really interested in expanding accessibility to healthcare, making healthcare more affordable. Uh, So that's what I do. Which was harder, the the nursing degree or the law degree? Uh, they're different. Like nursing <laughs> is very, I know I'm coughing out of answering this question. Nursing <laughs> is very like emotional. There's a lot of um, like latent stress, you know, when you're helping patients. The floor that I was on, we got a lot of um, drug addiction patients, a lot of patients that had just been in operations. Um, So the hours were really difficult and the emotional stress was really difficult. Um, I find law just so intellectually challenging. Um, And a lot of the work you do is just on a much larger scale. So when you're, you know, writing a policy that's going to affect hundreds of people, it's a different kind of stress. Um, And a lot of the times you're kind of starting from scratch. So you're making up the rules. Um, I mean, not fully making them up, but you know, you're, you're coming up with policies on your own. And so it's a lot of pressure, but they're both great. I I really enjoyed both of them. My, my wife is a nurse and I at one point wanted to go into law actually. So oh, okay. you wanted to go into law at one point. Interesting. Yeah, I was a judicial vice president of my campus, my collegiate campus. Uh, long cool. story, but yeah. Nice. What type of I was nurse the... is your wife? <laughs> She's what, what kind of nursing does she do? Yeah, sorry. I know I'm not supposed to ask the question. Oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> she's, she's all different types all over, but uh, um, she was doing urgent care for for the longest time, I guess, was the majority of what she's Very done. Cool. So, surgery, like outpatient stuff. Well, I was the student council president when I was in high school, so that's as close as I got to the law in that sense. Well, I was the high school chapel leader, so basically the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is. That That is very true. Okay, so I really appreciate you guys kind of sharing those two different journeys to get into that and like kind of where you're at at this point and where we started. I wanted to go a little bit in the middle and I'll start with you, Tay. Um, You know, I I feel like there's a lot of experiences or life experience, especially as an adoptee, to be, you know, growing up in Colorado, like you said, and and it seemed like you were hinting at a conservative. familial situation or maybe community situation, then to bounce around and do a lot of those things. I'm wondering as an adoptee, what did that play any role in like the experiences that you had in choosing the career and the things that you wanted to do in your life as you were trying to figure that out? Oh yeah, definitely. I I think, you know, growing up, I I just wasn't around minorities. Um, So once a year for a long weekend, I'd go to like an adoptee camp. Um, you know, we're, we're rolling kimbap and learning about some of the, the cultural elements of Korea. But otherwise, I think I was largely in a, a living a black white race dichotomy, right? So you have a white people as a majority, black people as a minority, and then there's me. Um, and, you know, seeing that and in a sense being forced to be able to relate to both, right? Mm-hmm. Um, gave, me, gave me a sense of uh, empathy, I suppose, right? When people say Black Lives Matter, I'm not going to say that, you know, obviously that affects me very differently than an African-American person. But, you know, having friends growing up who are African-American, seeing, witnessing, from an outside perspective, witnessing some of their struggles, I think, gave me a unique perspective, particularly as an Asian-American, gave me a unique perspective. At the same time, being around family, friends, and relatives who were, you know, right, far right before far right was a thing, and (laughs) as it is today, um, you know, gave me also a, a perspective on people who own small businesses and are going to vote for Trump or vote for someone who's very conservative out because of, you know, lower a desire for lower taxes or whatever it may be. Um, so in a sense, it gave me a perspective, both sides of an issue. 
which, uh, you know, I think has helped equip me when I'm in law school and so forth, when I was in law school, um, to be able to argue both sides, right? Uh, and even then, I think the law is a great tool to be able to effectuate change, whether from a policy standpoint, whether you're lobbying or writing policy or a legal standpoint, if you're uh, in a courtroom litigating, um, you know, we're surrounded by the law. Every, so much of our life we go through, uh, if we look at the microphones or the computers we're using, there are a lot of contracts that went into that lawyers are drafting those contracts. Um, everything from getting the aluminum for the MacBook to the logo and getting that trademark. So we're surrounded by the law, and I, I think it's a great way to, to be able to do some good and um, you know change the world, even if a little bit at a time. Yeah, that's a great comment about being in, in law, specifically having an open mind to both sides of the stories. I think that's very important for your job. Uh, is, is, you know, people right now are, are doing the opposite of that on Facebook. They're blocking, they're unfriending, they're taking anybody who has an opposing view and just saying, nope, I don't want to listen to it. Whereas you kind of have to, especially in law, uh, listen to both sides of the story. So um, that's great that that's something that you have done and, and kind of seen from your growing up experience. So. Yeah, especially um, we talked about, or especially from an adoptee perspective, um, and this may be a little bit different from you, but from our in our last episode, we talked about um, seeing the plurality of the opinions of adoption that are out there. And coming from that community, you almost have to be, you can get very political and take one side or the other, but in order to like really start to get an understanding of the whole picture of it, you have to be able to see kind of both those sides. And sometimes for adoptees, it takes a long time to figure that out. But uh, I think to your journey specifically, you know, coming up in, in law and thinking of it in that way and having so many different areas uh, to live and, and to experience those things. Um, I think that's just really cool kind of correlation there um, where we almost have to be or have to be willing to want to take that all in, take everything in like that. We've also on previous episodes talked about third culture kids. And that's another reason that I wanted you, Nori, to come on with Tay uh, onto this episode and to share your experiences and your story a little bit. I'm wondering kind of that same question as you approached, you know, what you wanted to do as a career. And then even then when you went and did a, a different thing, but in within that kind of that same genre, I suppose, um, did being part of a family who immigrated here and has been, you know, part of many cultures, did, did that play a, a significant role in that the decision to go in that direction? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think in many ways, um, one major way being, you know, my parents, um, they sacrificed a lot to come to America. Um, my parents, both my dad is an engineer. Uh, my mom was a solicitor in England, which is a lawyer in England. And, um, when they came here, neither of them had their degrees or licenses to work with. And so they both worked, you know, um, my mom worked as a bank teller. My dad worked at a 7-Eleven for a while. And I was growing up when, you know, they were building their American dream. And so I watched a lot of that. And so I think um, going into college, I felt almost like I wanted to honor them by choosing a career that, you know, was stable where I could you know, when they take care of them and, and, you know, really solidify our family's financial stability in this country. Um, so that was definitely something I wasn't really willing to, to take a risk initially. Um, and then I think as my career has progressed, um, and I, I do identify as a third culture kid, um, especially since my mom grew up in England. So I feel like I'm, you know, one more step removed from India. Um, I, I've noticed that as I progress in my career, I see less and less Asian Americans around me. Um, there are a lot of Asian Americans in the medical field, but in the legal field, um, you see a lot of Asian American associates, but you don't see partners or managing partners or equity partners. Um, and so I definitely feel like sometimes a lot of my drive is simply that I want, I want other Asian Americans to, to go to law school and, you know, affect change because because that's what lawyers do, right? And if we want to um, advocate for our rights in this country, if we want to establish ourselves and make positive change, you know, these are the careers that we should be investing in. Um, but it's scary when you go to work and no one looks like you, you know, and no one understands, you know, your specific needs or the issues that you face. So um, I think that 
representation is always on my mind. She's calling you out, Nathan. It's never too late to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, <laughs> also, like, no. wait until when you're like done with the show. Just kidding, it's too late need, for you. We need you to do it. It's too late. Show. Yeah, I, I read. I read at a third grade level, so there's no way I can. Oh, do it. dang, <laughs> self burn. Yeah. So, so, yes. When I found out you had to read quickly and then in law school, I'm like, oh no, I'm out. I'm out. So. <laughs> Nope, I'm out. Is there an audiobook version of this? I'm, nope, I'm out of here. I gotta go. I got as far as buying the LSAT book, <laughs> and that was about it. <laughs> Moving on. So that kind of takes me to what my next question was going to be for Tay. Just talking a little bit more about your experience as an adoptee specifically. Um, you've given us a little bit of that background and how those things fueled your ambition to do certain things uh, with your career. I'm wondering for you specifically, and especially for us, because we're all Korean adoptees, what was your first step or what was the first moment that you were like, I'm going to, I want to engage with this community or be a part of, or be a part of this community. Like be a part of the Asian American community or be a part of the adopted community. The adop- well, I guess both, I, I suppose. Uh, if they yeah. were at different times. Yeah. I yeah. Guess. Cause for me, it was definitely different times. Yeah. Just yeah, different times. Exactly. Man, uh, yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, engaging in the adoptee community specifically was probably going to these uh, camps, uh, these long weekends every summer. I didn't go consistently even, but, you know, I I went a couple of times in high school, um, I don't know, two or three times in high school. And I think that was really formative for me. I was really struggling with my racial identity, uh, and that really helped me see people who were in similar situations as me, people coming from St. Louis and Montana and Arizona, you know, all coming together for a long weekend. Where were those? Uh, some mountain town in Colorado. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Is that like a YMCA camp? I don't know. All right. But there'll be like a thousand people there, and it's all like middle-aged Whoa. white people, and then like really young, like Korean people. But Interesting. Kind of fun to see. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Wait, so were you like learning how to roll kimbap from middle-aged white people? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Well, so Interesting. Okay. okay. <laughs> there was a, I expected there was to hear a, like Minnesota or like yeah. yeah but <laughs> yeah. That's, there's a uh, Korean church in Denver that like would help. Um, they, so they'd send volunteers and stuff. So it wasn't all middle aged. I mean, I think I can roll a pretty mean kimbap, or I don't know. I mean, I have <laughs> never tried, so I just yeah, made I haven't tried to make it first yet. time. So yeah, my first time was three years ago. So <laughs> again, it's very you. You beat us all. <laughs> we have that. <laughs> You have a lot more knowledge. Now you're, the... you're going to have to roll some for us and send it to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, Give us yeah. your tips. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in terms of engaging in the Asian American community, I, I think that's very recent. I would say uh, moving to uh, a little bit in when I was in California um, with the AAPI community out there, just with the friends and so forth. Um, but really diving into it, I'd say it was within the last five years, going to law school, moving out to the Northern Virginia, D.C. area. Um, I, yeah, I've gotten connected pretty well. I'm a, a member of the Virginia Asian Advisory Board, which is a gubernatorial position um, with the state. Um, so yeah, getting connected and networking and so forth now. So pretty recently in, in adulthood. What about uh, the Korean adoptee community as you've engaged in the Asian American community as an adult, like pretty recently? Has that has that been another thing? Because I know, uh, and we're about to, uh, I want to start asking about Nunchi and, and talking about that. Um, I know you guys sh- have been sharing a lot of adoptee stories. Um, I'm wondering when was that after you had engaged, you know, as a high schooler and stuff and went to those camps, when was that first kind of re-engagement with the adoptee community? Uh, if you have, uh, at that or since then uh so i i started the process of trying to find my birth family when was this like fall 19 it was last july or august yeah uh last year okay and that's when i really was starting to engage with the dot the uh, specifically the korean american adoptee community um because there's a lot of resources specifically on facebook mm-hmm. excuse me specifically on facebook uh, so, yeah, Noor and I, we're kind of like digging around, looking and, and seeing what resources were available. So, you know, to facilitate this uh, reconnection process. And how did that go? Did Were you able to reconnect with them? Or, I mean, if, if you want to share that. Yeah, no, dude, it was crazy. I mean, so we're reading stories, you know, where it would take eight to 10 years, you know, sometimes 
you know, unfortunately there are circumstances where the birth mother, the birth father is, has passed away or mm-hmm. doesn't want to reconnect or doesn't feel safe to reconnect. Um, I contacted my adoption agency and then within the month, I think we had our first call with my birth mother. Wow. Yeah. Um, so pretty wild. And it kind of fell <laughs> on top of my studying for the bar because I, you know, I thought this would take years, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's been a very good experience. I was actually just texting my birth mother before we hopped on the call. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we were going to, I was going to take the bar. And then the day after I took the bar, we were flying to Daegu, which the bar was in February. And if you know, remember Daegu with COVID, it was, mm-hmm. you know, they had like 8,000 cases. And we thought that was crazy. Even though I think <laughs> yesterday the U.S. had like 160,000 yeah. cases. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah. we were like, well, we can't fly to Daegu. They have 8,000 cases, right? <laughs> uh, so we canceled that. And we've been just sitting around waiting for Trump to, or excuse me, um, we've been waiting for COVID to get under control. So we can you know, fly. Yeah. I agree. I've been waiting for that to out. get under control oh too. It's gonna come out at some point. So it's just it's funny so that good. like that's generally like our show is generally like an apolitical podcast. I mean, like it's not like but it comes out so specific. Out. But like it's hard to uh, stay like just shy away from that given the current climate of the year and also <laughs> yeah, now and with timing. two people who are yeah and they're intrinsically <laughs> in tied together and you can't DC separate them. and yeah yeah it's such a weird but i, I appreciate yeah. it you're like oh wait, no look uh, i mean the adopted community a lot of us grew up with very conservative white parents right mm-hmm. uh, uh parents who might have voted to the right you know and um i i think that you know i don't think the republican party is necessarily sorry you may have to delete all this but i don't, I don't <laughs> oh, think no. the, <laughs> it's all right. I don't think the Republican Party is necessarily like anti-minority, right? I think that'd be right. false to say. I right. think there, there's been a certain dialogue within the last four years coming out of the administration that has been, you know, and that's just yes. my belief. And I think that I think adoptees have struggled with, you know, dialoguing with other adoptees on Facebook and through Nunchi. That there's a lot of tension between an adoptee who says, "Hey, like, why, why is the administration? Why are my own parents, my in-laws, my uncles?" saying these things about minorities, right? And that, does, that that kind of language, negative language doesn't comport with who I am or my racial identity. A lot of tension going on. And I think, you know, in the last four years, yeah, a lot of tension that the adoptees have had to wrestle with politically. Yeah, well, and I think it's so interesting too, because like for me, I didn't start, uh, well, I just, just finished Glenn Morey's Audible original uh, given away. Uh, and he, in that he uses the term self-racializing, which is a new term for me, but I don't know, it makes sense when I heard it, but like, so I didn't start, like, I didn't really start understanding myself as Asian, um, and a minority until this year. And so like, when I think about, uh, some of the arguments and like heated discussions that you see or hear about in Facebook groups and things like being raised by conservative uh, you know, white parents, and then like being given their worldview and not knowing anything different. And then like, when you start to realize like, oh, wait, actually, like, I've, I've heard a lot of bad things, like, you know, about how minorities struggle and things like that. And then like, later in life, realizing that you are one of them, and then being like, well, wait, now all of my political ideology, just suddenly, like you just come into like this huge tension. And it's not like a, I like to think that on the whole, Um, certainly there are exceptions to this, but you know, like generally your adoptive parents weren't like out to just like totally mess up your worldview, but like, there's just kind of a unique reckoning in being transracially adopted that you're like, Oh, uh, I see that like my beliefs about, you know, how the government should operate for, um, minorities or immigrants or whatever. Um, like I used to think like a white person did, except I realized that like some of the policies that I maybe even potentially voted for, depending on when you wrestle with this is like actively hurting myself as well so yeah i think it's just like we we don't want to be super political because we try to keep it fun and light and usually politics are neither of those things um but uh (laughs) but i think that 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 is a reality of just being transracially adopted yeah definitely yeah yeah there are that's something that i'm learning and what i'm reckoning with with my own being a transracial transnational adoptee is you know, a lot of the, not necessarily the politics of it, but being able, like I talked about earlier, the plurality of all these sides of all these different stances that the adoptee community, specifically the Korean adoptee community takes against each other. 
And it's it's really jarring, I think, to see it first. But for me, it's been, I don't know, I think I've come in at a unique perspective and a unique time to kind of see it from an outside view. And, you know, I think that something we're trying to do with this show when looking at the community in that perspective is to be able to talk about things that are maybe a little bit divisive, but bring levity, not necessarily not making light of the situation, but to make sure that we can stay on topic, but also allow people to deliver their message in a way that we can keep thoughtful and, you know, we can keep the conversation and the dialogue going. So I'm hoping that's what we're doing. Um, yeah. I don't Fingers know if crossed. we are. I honestly don't know I, if I we are, but jokes, I think we are. The jokes keep the emotions low, which I think is <laughs> is helpful to having a good discussion. Um, okay, so I'm, I want to ask a question, and I don't want to butcher your pronunciation and the pronunciation of your name, because my first thought is your name is Nori, but that's also the Japanese term for like seaweed, so like maybe that's wrong. So please, because there's two O's, right? In your yeah. So is it name. Nuri or is it Nori, well, or are you just like you just whichever said it one? Perfectly. Comes out? So I, I always tell myself I'm not going to do this, but I always let people just call me Nori. Um, it's Nuri. Um, Nuri. And Nuri. I think it's really hard for people to say like with mm. an American accent. Um, but my name is actually Nuri. Arabic because my family's Indian Muslim. Um, and so Noor in Arabic means light and I, um, denotes possession. So it's my light. Oh, um, cool. So yeah, that's my name, Love but that. you said it perfectly. Okay. So good yes. job. Okay. So Noor, um, the sense that I have gotten from other people of color in America who aren't adopted is as adoptees are coming to this conversation and everybody else who is not white is like, yeah, we've thought about this. For like a long time. So uh, is that true for you? Has that been like a thing that you have wrestled with? Um, yeah, uh, just kind of like the, the political side of things. And, and how has that, um, maybe from your perspective, how has that uh, translated to how you interact with Taejin? Tay? That is a really interesting question. Um, so personally, not to get into politics or anything, um, but <laughs> sure. I, I think heard... this is the title of the episode is just not to get into politics, but we're going to go ahead and get into politics. <laughs> and I'm sorry, you two need to learn. He brought it up. He brought it up. So, um, But I, I mean, I grew up in a very, very liberal community. Um, you know, I was very lucky, I think, um, being an immigrant that... Um, Northern Virginia is a very, very diverse place. Um, it actually has an enormous um, Korean American community. Um, so I was fortunate to grow up with a lot of diversity around me. And frankly, I associated the Republican Party with whiteness growing up. Um, sure. I know that's I mean, not politically correct did. at all. It just, I knew that <laughs> they were my, you know, minorities that were Republican. It just, it, you know, I didn't come across them too often. Um, largely when I did, they were single issue voters. So it was a pro-life thing. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was always, there was always some kind of excuse to be made for it really. Um, not that there's, you know, anything wrong with having any, you know, particular ideology, just that was my like youthful conception of it. Um, but I think, um, as adults, you know, I think the more that we talk about our political beliefs and our, just our viewpoints on the world, you know, we largely agree. Um, I think that it's really interesting because I would never try to make comparisons with the adoptee experience, but um, there are certainly some some shared experiences just, you know, looking the way we do and living in this country. Um, and so I think that most of the time we're able to understand each other. Um, and that's something that, you know, has been so powerful for me with Nunchi is like getting those more diverse perspectives. Um, so like one thing we're trying to do on our page is just not really censor anything. So, you know, we solicit submissions, we post them, people read them. Um, and that's been really eye opening for me because growing up, you know, I really only had exposure to this one world. Um, but we definitely have had some interesting conversations. Um, for example, um, gun rights. Um, so like Tay having grown up in Colorado is just a lot more comfortable with that than I am. Um, and so, I mean, I think one thing that I really value in our relationship is that, you know, we both just were very comfortable being like, well, this is what I think. Let's talk about it. You know, like I want to understand you. Um, and so I think that 
yeah, like we've been able to, even if we don't agree on everything, like we can understand each other. Yeah, and that's great. I think following on the themes of last episode, uh, supportive. So supportive team team members or partners or, or whatever the case is. Uh, I think it's great. And I think that's the crux of a good relationship is having that support and that communication, being open. You know, that's something that my fiance and I like to pride ourselves on is being very open and honest with each other. So thanks, Emily. I'm going to leave that. You can cut that. We're going to cut that out. Okay. So, <laughs> so all right. double that one up. So we've teased it out. A, we've teased it out a little bit. Um, and you just talked about kind of what you guys are doing with it now, but Noonchi company, uh, I want to yeah. start for our audience who may not know what is Noonchi. Sure. Um, so we started Noonchi company as our passion project. Um, it's a digital media company. So, um, if you're not familiar with that is, it's, you know, Buzzfeed is a good example, um, Refinery29. Um, so basically, it's kind of like an online publication. Uh, we write articles about the Asian American experience. Um, we also feature Asian Americans from around the country um, so that they can tell their stories. Um, so right now, it's National Adoption Awareness Month. So we've been doing a lot of adoptee voices. And we really just want it to be uh, kind of like the the digital media company or the publication that we wish that we had had when we were kids. Um, something that can help people explore their Asian American identities, a place where you can meet people, um, just really like a safe space. Yeah, when I was growing up, I, I like, I didn't think being Korean or being Asian was cool. And then when I decided that it was cool, there was no model for it outside of, literally like outside of Bruce Lee and mm -hmm. Tokyo Drift. Yeah, right? so I love <laughs> the worst. Yeah, so like, the worst. I love the kind of civics, but uh, I had no conception that there was a different a distinction between Japanese and Korean, right? I mean, like right. generally I did, but it was Asian, and that was good enough, right? And so I think for me and she, you know, I want to. I, I'm acutely aware of people, uh, Asian Americans, in in places geographically isolated from their communities, from their heritage, and so forth. And I'm hoping that this can be a, a small outlet for that. Yeah, I feel like you guys have been sharing a lot of great stories. I really love to see those things because I feel like right now I'm in this, for myself, personal renaissance of trying to absorb as many stories as possible and just having and more outlets is great. And I appreciate you guys allowing me to share my story um, on there as well. Um, what? So we're the John Chi Show and it took us a long time to come to that name. And to figure out that John Chi was the word that we wanted to use. I'm wondering what it, what is, if you could define Noon Chi for our audience, what, what is that and why, why that specific word? What, what was it about that, that that was going to be the name of, of this venture for you guys? And before you answer, uh, the first thing I saw when I went to your website earlier was this really tasty looking sushi. <laughs> I was just like Nunchi Company, can I order some of this? Because this is really good. No, you can't order any of that. Oh, okay. Continue. <laughs> do you want to do it, or you want yeah, me to go for it? Okay. Um, <laughs> so we actually sat on this one for a really long time. Um, so I won't speak for Tay, but for me personally, um, I love learning languages and. Um, currently, like with the pandemic, we've been home so much. Um, so my family is Urdu speaking. Um, Urdu is like a creole of like Hindi and Farsi and Arabic. Um, they speak it in my city in India. But I'm a receptive bilingual, meaning like I can fully understand it, but I have a lot of trouble speaking it, which is a common third culture kid problem. Um, so I'm learning that. And then we're also both learning Korean. Um, and I think we really fell in love with Nunchi as a name for our company because it's kind of this intangible concept that you, know, you can't really neatly define in English. It's like this idea of, you know, being self-aware and understanding your own emotions and your own needs and, um, you know, how to conduct yourself in society, but then also, being in tune with other people. So, you know, you could liken it to being able to read the room or um, the ability to be introspective. And, and I think that's really what, what everyone who's contributed to our site is trying to do, right? We're trying to find ourselves 
We're trying to make connections. We're trying to create a community in a place where our ancestors didn't live. Um, so it just kind of seemed like it fit. Yeah, definitely. I also wondered, because this is a pretty new venture, you guys just started this, like the website and the the social media parts, like two, three months ago. Is that right? Yeah, two months. And you said, and Tay, you said that you've been just recently on this journey where you've now been reconnected with like your birth mother and your birth uh, or your biological family in some sense. Um, I'm, I was wondering, did that specific moment in time, like, or, or that part of your journey, was that something, uh, an impetus for starting this as well? Or were you guys, have you guys been sitting on this for a while as in we're going to, we were going to launch this and just now is the right time. Yeah, I, I think it was a, partially it was a motivator. Um, we wanted to, we're big into financial independence and becoming, you know, financially independent as young professionals. Um, and, you know, we didn't want to do the drop shipping route or uh, Uber Eats or anything like that. Um <laughs> Well, that's stupid. Okay, maybe just that. Yeah. I don't know if Uber <laughs> Eats and like financial love, independence. Like, I mean, I would love <laughs> for someone to be like, I'm financially independent as an Uber driver. Like, it's amazing. Hey, I saw an Uber driver possible, driving a Tesla I'll just once. Quit so. my job right now. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I in law? <laughs> I could be an Uber driver. <laughs> Let me just start over. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously going to keep all of that in. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. So I think that, you know, finding, finding my birth mother um, really was a big motivator in what this future, then what this future endeavor would be, which is now Nunchi. Um, and so I have, I found my birth mother and I have three uh, half brothers, younger, a little younger than me. And then I have a couple uncles and they do a couple aunts in Seoul. Um, yeah, pretty pretty big family, several cousins. And we're just all waiting around for to, to get out there to Korea. That's a lot. So you, so you haven't met them then because of the, the pandemic, like you were saying? That's correct, yeah. I feel like that's a lot of family members that you're able to find out that you to, or get reunited with. I feel like for some of the stories and, and a lot of the things that I see, it's or like you said, you know, if there's anything at all, it's usually a parent has died or both parents have passed away and you're finding siblings, you know, um, Nathan found a whole bunch of siblings, um, which was really cool. Um, and just like you said too, like, you know, some people wait a long time and I just think it's really, and I, that, the reason I asked if that was a motivator was because it happened so quickly for you. You know, you didn't have to wait even eight months. You had, you waited one month and they were like, Here's a call. Here, here's your birth mother. Have a phone call. You know, I think that's I think that's amazing. I think that's uh, that's a story that I haven't heard before. Um, is somebody getting re reunited so quickly? Um, have you had a lot of connection like with your your half brothers? Have have you have you found like any similarities or anything? Uh, stuff that cross has crossed over, or have you not had enough time yet, really, to to develop any of that? Yeah, I, I think a little bit. Uh, I think. On one hand, there are definitely cultural differences. Um, Koreans have a big aversion to firearms, which if you know anything about Korea, or, <laughs> sorry, if you know anything about Colorado, Colorado do not have an aversion to firearms. Um, <laughs> they love hunting and deer hunting, all this craziness. It's from Open my parents caring. live. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but on the other hand, uh, yeah, they're definitely, you know, I, I think what's kind of fun for me to see is like, oh, like our like, our noses are the same or, Oh, that's where I, I know I'm, my head is shaved at the moment, but like, oh, we have like the same hair, stuff like that, kind of fun. When you so when you saw photos for the first time, you were like, was that like the first thing you were judging? Was like, how similar do they look like me? Yeah, yeah, I had this like bump on my nose, and I was always like, did did I get hit? Like, did I get in a fight <laughs> when I was a kid, or is this like genetic? I, I actually can't tell if I broke my nose. <laughs> As a six month old, like, did oh, some other six month old someone drop me? me? It's yeah. genetic. It happens to be genetic. <laughs> That's what I have. I have little dimples in the back of my ears, and that's the exact same thing I did. It is when I met all of my siblings. I asked them, "Does anyone have any dimplings on the back of their ears?" Because because I got these weird, di and they all looked at each other like, "No." And then so <laughs> apparently, it's not hereditary. It is not something that anyone else has. I thought but for sure I just you're gonna say weird they trying to translate dimples. So yeah, I thought for but, sure you're gonna say they had the dimples. That's they hilarious. all. I wish they had all had it. I thought that would have been cool, but. 
No, the only thing that my brother and I shared was the way we walk, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's very similar. Wait, did you just put your arms out to your side and wave them? I, I can't, can't wait stand to up see and you walk. Is, yeah, I know. That's for the, <laughs> just, for the podcast listeners. You can watch me do that. So there you go. That's, that's the like, thing. We've never met before in person, so I've wave. never seen you walk. I've only yeah. seen oh. you sitting. I've never yeah, seen you walking. Good point. Well, you guys have seen me walking because I've just. You guys have never met in person. I would have yeah, guessed that, that you've known each other for years. <laughs> no, no, we uh, Since... we just met in September and then, no, oh, really? like in August, yeah. late August, oh, and then wow. we're like, "You want to start a podcast together?" <laughs> yeah, Jerry, the our producer was on earlier. He hosts a show called Dear Asian Americans, and we were all guests oh, on yeah. there. Um, and then. When I was coming on, he was like, yeah, I have these two other uh, adoptees that I think you guys should just, what if you do a show? And then I was like, sure. And we, I remember the first time we all got on the call together and I was like, I don't know about this. I know. I was like, God, I hope these guys don't suck. <laughs> what if they're so I hope these guys boring. don't like critique me on how I walk. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, that apparently that's going to be the first conversation I when we do. I Zoom meetings <laughs> walking. Just... That comes uh-huh. much later. Okay. <laughs> now I'm very self-conscious. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, Just send us a video. <laughs> So, so are you the only one with the dimples in the ear, or does, does that share yes. amongst the... I'm also the oldest of everyone here, so yes, okay. they, <laughs> they're critiquing all the little things. You're the oldest of your, are you the oldest of your siblings, too? Did we talk the about that? Oh, you're youngest the youngest. Seven. Oh, yeah, Did you yeah, even yeah. listen to his episode, bro? Uh, I forgot. That was like the first episode. That was like, <laughs> that was that 10 was like weeks ago. That was ages ago. ago. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so I'm wondering with... I feel like you guys have had a lot of a really good feedback and, and a lot of positive interactions on the Noonchi page on Instagram, especially um, a lot of con- connection, a lot of engagement. Um, what were you, what, what were you initially expecting to come of this when you started it? Were, did you guys have a certain like expectation or goal? Like we're going to share this many stories or do this, or was it, what, 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 what was that? What did that look like? I guess at the start. Um, I don't think we really had anything planned. I mean, we we both have a lot of articles that we wanted to write. You know, we have this giant list of topics we made in the very beginning, and we're kind of working through that. Um, but I think for everything else, we, you know, we want to write about what people want to read about. And so we've just been reaching out to a lot of people, trying to make connections and see what people are interested in. Um, we've definitely gotten a lot of, great feedback from the adoptee community it's been like really cool to see um how just like active and engaged it is um and yeah we're just kind of going with the flow and seeing where it takes us so since having all of this feedback what uh, I, I mean it's two months i guess i'm i'm just speculating for you so i apologize but what are the next steps for you guys with Noonji? I mean, just to continue to share stories or... Yeah, I, I think it's to continue for the time being because we are new. It's to continue to get that engagement level up. Um, you know, I, I think it's not just our voice that we want to promote, but it's the people like you guys, right? It's the our fellow Asian Americans' voices. And I think we want to continue to use Noonji as a platform, as a vehicle to promote other people's voices as well. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, getting engagement up. Yeah, and I think one thing that I, I've noticed, too, with the Asian American community at large um, is that a lot of the kind of like subgroups, you know, the South Asians, the Southeast Asians, the East Asians, um, we tend to keep to ourselves. And I think that's really unfortunate because, I mean, from a political standpoint, this is why we never make an impact in politics. It's because we refuse to band together, um, but also because it's it can be such a source of comfort to connect with other types of Asians. Like for me growing up, um, most of my friends weren't Indian, you know, but I had a lot of minority friends from a lot of countries and um, it's awesome. Like I, one of my best friends growing up was Persian. I love Persian culture. I love Persian food. Um, Sometimes it feels like it's mine, even though it's not, you know, (laughs) Um, but I think when you're, when you're an immigrant or when you're just a minority living in this country, um, you kind of grasp onto whatever you can find. And, you know, for a lot of people, they might, you know, be the only Korean in their town or the only Indian in their town. But if you can find other Asians, you know, at least you don't feel like so alone or just, you know, the token minority. Um, and so I also want it to be a place where we can learn about each other's cultures and 
find commonalities in that. I know like with my sister-in-law, for example, like, you know, I, she sends me like Korean recipes and I always look at the ingredients and I'm like, wow, it's so crazy. Cause like 70% of these ingredients are Indian ingredients too, but they taste so different the way, you, you know, depending on how you cook them. Right. Um, and that was so like, you know, interesting for me to like, be like, oh, this is all familiar. This is all stuff I can get at the Indian store too. You know, <laughs> like we're not all so different. And I know that sounds cheesy, but, um, I'm hoping that she can be like a real like Asian American society and not an Indian American one or Korean American one or, you know, whatever group you want to call it. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. I real I think, you know, I think that's what we're trying to do here in an adoptee sense. It's not to say we only have one type of adoptee story to tell. It's that there are a lot of adoptee stories out there to be told. Um, and what we really like to do or would like to do, I think I would like to do, um is tell some of those stories from people who haven't had the chance you know it's great when we have like a glenn maury or a dan matthews on because you know those are big names in the community people know them and their stories are important because they've done big things for the community um but i think and i think of it really as just my own personal journey is that for a long time i didn't want to share my story i didn't even want that story to be a part of my life I was very, you know, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want this. I'm, I'm over here. And to find the, not only find the community, but to find so much of it to be so engaging and so supportive as we've been talking about, uh, not only for me being so new to it, but then seeing, you know, other new people or, or people that are new to this experience come in and then receive the same support and then see them turn around and now start supporting other people to come. And, and do these things. You know, I think that's what I really love about Noonshi and the community that you guys are, are creating is that it really does feel like anybody can come in and, and now tell their story. And I asked, like, if you're all, if you were sharing adoptee stories earlier, I'm just completely forgetting that it was adoptee, National Adoptee Awareness Month. And obviously, you're going to be sharing adoptee stories right now. But <laughs> in the preceding months, other stories are going to be coming up from all sects of Asian America. And I am really excited to start to see those as well and to engage with that community. So I said all of that to not ask a question, but to say thank you for doing that because, um, you know, there's not a, there's as much as everyone's doing a podcast or launching a website or whatever, there's not enough still. We're still fighting for the representation that we want to see. We're still trying to even define what that representation is going to look like in one year. Not, not only just the next day. So thank you for doing that. And I don't have a question. So I think guys. my question for you <laughs> would be, uh, what can we do to help you? Um, and that's, that's a thing that I think has been on uh, my heart and uh, Nathan and Patrick's as well. It's just like, you know, we realized uh like oh we need this community and we are seeing this community grow and i think um at least the sense that i get is like there was some great pioneering done and then it took a brief break and now we're back again um <laughs> especially in 2020 and just kind of like given where we are in in the co collective uh sensibilities and like actual abilities to build community so um as much as we love what you're doing what can we do to help uh further your cause of uh you know seeing all asian americans be represented and be an inspiration to other asian americans so i i think that there is the there are many things that, that people can do right i think the first step at least from a personal coming from my own personal experiences the first step is that uh, to continue to, and I'm not speaking directly to any one of you guys or anyone sp specifically, but to really get to know yourself, right? And to say, hey, you know, if I if I grew up with these beliefs, and I'm not specifically, I'm not talking about political beliefs, just beliefs about myself, about the world, are those beliefs that I want to embrace, or those, you know, beliefs that I can move forward in life with? Um, that that self introspection is so important and you can contribute more to people if you know yourself, I think. And as you get to know yourself, maybe you want to, you know, help someone learn English at your local library, right? That's a that's a huge, a huge part of, you know, in Virginia, we have the fastest growing population, Asian Americans do, 
And a lot of Asian American or Asians coming to Virginia do not are not fluent in English. And libraries are one resource that are teaching people English. Um, and I'm not saying that from a standpoint of people need to assimilate and speak English in America. I'm saying that because how do you go to the DMV if you don't speak English? Or right. rent an apartment if you don't speak English, you can't read the rental application. Um, for me as an attorney, I mean, there are other areas that I'm going to invest my time, effort, my energy into to contribute to the community. And that's coming from my own introspection, my talents, my skills that I have cultivated and I'm growing. Um, you know, specifically, I, I think there there is often a, I find it within minority communities in general that there's often a negative narrative, like, oh, well, this person is, you know, this adoptee is a Trumper living in Wyoming. They're not one of us, right? And you're like, I- I'm not going to say that they're not where I am because I disagree with them. They, I'm not going to say, okay, they are just, they have not evolved their racial identity to the point where I'm at, right? Instead, mm-hmm. I think, and I mean, I'm sometimes guilty of that, okay? But I, I, I instead want to change that narrative to say, okay, they're at a different place and that's okay, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of Korean adoptees, we are isolated, right? And we do what we have to do to survive and that's okay. I, I do think there is a lot of judgment and negativity going back and forth. And, you know, for me, I mean, it'd be even like, I don't like going to Korean restaurants. I didn't like going to Korean restaurants as a kid because the, the waiters would come up and say, or the servers, excuse me, would come up and say, speak to me with, in Korean with my white parents. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know Korean. Right. But can I get a fork? You're right. Because I don't know how to use chopsticks, you know? <laughs> We've all been ex- there, right? And then you I know like, exactly yeah, that like experience. Stab something with a chopstick, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think there's, you know, I don't know. I'm rambling at this point, but I think there's a lot we can do, and it depends on your skill sets, your passions, what you want to invest into. For those people who are isol- who do find themselves isolated and, and cut off from other minorities, uh, you know, we, some of us, I'm, I'm thirty. I didn't actually grow up with social media until MySpace, right? But nowadays we have access to Facebook groups, very vibrant communities online of Korean adoptees. Um, Yeah, I mean, I don't know. TikTok, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I'm too old for that. (laughs) I don't know if there's communities there. But yeah, a lot of fun, fun communities to engage into um, where you can kind of get to know yourself a little better and it can be very fruitful, I think. Yeah, and I, I think I would add on to that too, like um, specifically like for Nunchi and for podcasts like yours, I think, um, you know, one of the ways, one of the best ways that we can contribute is just by creating communities, you know, so like on Nunchi, like I'm usually, if, if you get a message on Nunchi, it's usually me. <laughs> um, and, you know, one thing I'm trying really hard to do when I reach out to people is not just say, hey, you want to like write a post? Cool. Thanks. Bye. Like, it's actually right. like talking to people and actually having a relationship because otherwise like people aren't going to be less lonely. People aren't going to feel you like they've you're trying to one. treat people like human beings. I mean, I, that's, Is that that's what crazy. I'm hearing you that's say? too much. Too much. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to, you're no longer welcome on the show and we're just going to erase the whole episode. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Talk to you never. <laughs> JK. <laughs> but I think I think a lot of these initiatives and I'm guilty of this too, especially like in the legal field where, you know, Tay and I will get people reaching out to us saying, Hey, I want to go to law school. Can you give me some resources? And you're busy. And so you shoot them some links and call it a day. But like really what we need in our communities is mentorship and friendship and like real like connections. You know, like after COVID, like I'd love to have like actual events where people can actually like hang out and, you know. They're not yes. just typing away on their keyboards. And yeah, actual um, I think that's something that is lost like? in this like social media generation, you know, and I think that's why people are so lonely because we're the generation that grew up in another country without people who look like us. And we're also the people who grew up sitting behind computers and that's not really, it doesn't fulfill you, right? It's just mm-hmm. a means to an end. Um, and so I think that maybe the best thing that we can do for our community is actually like create one, like a real one, you know, not a cyber one. You didn't yeah. notice already. Nori is the eloquent one in the room. Not true. I'm rambling. Like, what was I talking? Chopsticks? Like, I'm glad we let you... Well, actually, I was just going to say, I, I learned chopsticks from the back of a chopsticks package at my local Genghis Grill, which is like a, a, a 
We have one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, for the people that don't know, because like I didn't have a I Genghis haven't seen grill. one. I haven't seen one since leaving uh, Texas. The equivalent in, I guess, the Midwest is hoo hot. It's like a Mongolian oh, yep. grill. Yeah, yeah Mongolian you know, hoo hot. Anyways, yeah. Hoo-ha. So it was just like chopsticks was on the back, and I was like, I need to learn how to do this just to feel more. Uh, feel less inauthentic, I guess. <laughs> so I was just like, I just studied some paper and that's how I learned chopsticks. My dad was like, I would like a fork, please. And I'm jealous you even had a Korean restaurant, Tay. I, I didn't have anything in Oklahoma. Oh, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, we had a couple in Colorado, a, a couple pretty good. But you know, once I learned the, 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 uh, the white kids at school would be like, oh, well, the next goal is to catch a fly like Mr. Miyagi. Like, no, never good enough with you guys, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's I was like, fictional. you try to catch a fly with your hands, fool. Like, <laughs> I can do that, actually, but that's for another yeah, me time. me too. With your chopsticks or with your hands? No, with my hands. hands. We just uh, said yeah. chopsticks impossible. Hands, possible. Okay. Well, yeah, I not, have a large not Mr. hole Miyagi. in my hand, so I can't. <laughs> it always gets away from me. <laughs> Well, guys, uh, I really appreciate, or I know I don't want to speak for them, but I think we all really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and have this conversation. I really think that you guys gave great advice, each of you. Uh, Tay, I think getting to know yourself is a huge, huge thing that people don't take enough time to do. And that's something that I personally am trying to do right now. Uh, A lot of self-introspection. And Nori, creating communities also very very huge because once you start to understand yourself better that's when you can actually go out and make those connections and that's what you guys are doing right now with Noonchi. that's what we're trying to do with the john Chi. and we're gonna get there we're gonna get there and when all of this finally gets to a point where we can go and meet we're gonna have a big john Chi, and we're gonna have everybody come and we're gonna have a, a nice party where we can see each other and meet in re- for real because we'll all be meeting each other for the first time. So why not just meet all of our guests? So um, you have to make kimbap for everybody. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. You got to do a kim- <laughs> You got to do that. That's on you, Tay. You already set yourself up for that at the beginning of the top of the episode. Well, that's getting cut. So it's all good. okay. <laughs> um, could, where, where else can, where can people find Noonchi? Where can people find you guys online? If they want to follow along on this journey, um, Tell our audience where we can find you at. So uh, we are on Instagram, which Nori is primarily leading that up. And then we're on our website, NunchiCo.com. NunchiCompany.com. Sorry, NunchiCompany.com. <laughs> I know, I know Don't that. go to NunchiCo.com. We don't know You're what that close. is. You're close. You're <laughs> close. <laughs> uh, yeah, NunchiCompany.com, um, where I'm writing a lot of the content. Nori's writing some articles, too. Um, and then... We are on Twitter as well, which I think it's Nunchi Co. on Twitter. Twitter and Instagram are Nunchi Co. And then I'm doing the tweets. They got pretty political, just so your audience (laughs) knows. I got pretty political on Twitter. I didn't mean to, but it just came out. And I felt like I had to like reel back some and delete some tweets where I was. Yeah. Anyhow, we're on all three platforms. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I should caveat that by saying that all of our opinions are our own, but you know, this is a space for everyone and all are welcome. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Guys, Tay, Nori, thanks again for coming on. Um, Thank you guys. This yes. is a really, really great conversation. Thank you. Thank so you. And everybody else, stick around for a second. We're gonna come in back with some food, I think. Uh food go. or drink. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome back. We are eating food times. Yeah. Um, we are real, real grateful for Tay and Nori hanging out with us. Um, but it's just three of us. Yeah, yeah, John Chi boys eating lotes cocalcon. What? What did you say? That's that's what it's called. It's cocalcon. Popping corn chips is what it says. Sounds like you're saying like Coca-Cola corn. No, it says cocalcon. And then up top it says Popping. Popping. I don't know what that means. It's something about flavor. Dang, I wish I could. I really wish I could read read that. This is uh, Lote since 1983. Um, I have the original flavor, and I got grilled corn. Hey yo, not just corn, grilled corn. Patrick has sweet and spicy. Sweet and spicy. Uh, Just like Patrick. (laughs) 
Aww. <laughs> the things Nathan. I'm excited about, um, it looks like on the package that they they look like bugles. So I'm excited to get some witch fingers going on. And uh, don't be disappointed. I thought the same thing. All right, great. So I'm already Spoiler disappointed. Alert. Sorry, you looked at the picture. So I thought the same thing. I'm thinking, oh, these are going to be like little things. But then I looked at the picture. It looks uh -huh. like little triangle pockets. You like it doesn't like look like cones. Pockets, it looks like pockets. I know. Yeah. I'm, I haven't opened it yet, but that's what I'm assuming. And so that's why I'm already pre disappointed. Because, yeah, <laughs> I wanted bugles and witch fingers too. Hold oh, well. um, on. So, full disclosure, I think. I'm going to disclose this for him. Patrick has already eaten these because we were going to do this way earlier. <laughs> and then uh, he was like, well, we're not doing these. I'm just going to go ahead and eat them. Is that accurate? Yeah. Full disclosure, I did eat the grilled corn that Nathan has. Um, that was the kind that I bought for the original sh or food portion we were going to do for those. And I couldn't wait. I was Full hungry and needed a snack. Patrick cannot wait on any of the snacks <laughs> that we're eating. He eats them instantly i can't wait i don't I, love the smell it's easy when they're wrapped up and uh hmm. in another exterior wrapping like what jerry yeah did. when it's so. jerry's mystery box they survive but if, if patrick just buys it on his own it won't make it mine movie. does not smell bad it smells like corn chips so. you smell like corn chips i gotta I, get a better burn maybe it's because you have original yours smells like original <laughs> but no see it's a triangle hmm. it's a perfect triangle there's a, a a There's no pocket. witch finger no possibilities. Beauty. It kind of looks like a, an arrowhead or dragon's tooth or something. Shark tooth, right? Uh, I like the popping. Ooh, this is good. I'm a big yeah. fan. I think now you can see how I eat the whole bag. My yeah. flavor doesn't quite feel like bugles, but they're bugle adjacent. Maybe it's because they're not the grilled corn. Maybe the original. I See... I'm curious on what the difference between an original and a grilled corn would be. Because I assume the ingredients here. are almost, almost the same. I mean, is your first ingredient corn? Yes. yes. Yeah. So I don't see what there the is. difference between grilled corn Soy and Soy sauce original. powder in this. Yeah, I see that too. Mine is also corn. I like that the next ingredients after corn is blended edible oil. Just so that you know it's edible because, you know, it's not just oil. Oh, mine just has veggie oil. Mine has beef seasoning powder, parentheses, beef digestion solution. Mm, Yikes. Beef that does digestion. <laughs> well, mine is Great. good. What about y'all's? I definitely could eat these, and I'm sure this bag will be gone soon. Mine is also good. I will say that I found... Yes, our resident expert. Flash cheater. <laughs> I found that uh, Korean products, when labeled spicy... It, it tricks me <laughs> because I'm used to an American spicy, right. where like a like a flaming hot Dorito, which has been coated flaming with hot which has been coated with the flaming hot solution, which, of which I do not know the origin, and it will burn you. Yes, these are a sensible. This is a sensible spice. Mm I think I would like more, but I understand why it's less. Sure, and I like it. I still like hmm. it. Yeah, it's true. I have never had any chip that is made in uh, Korea that is too spicy. However, have you seen the chip challenge out here? People are doing it. It's like uh, oh, it's yeah. like a one chip with like ghost pepper or something on it. Yeah, that seems oh, crazy. I've seen it, but I haven't. If you want I spice, like apparently, you watch those videos. Those chips will kill you. I'm down. I like a hot chip. And Jerry, no, we're not going to do that on an episode. We're not going to do the chip challenge. I'll do it. You want to watch us die. Okay. Patrick will do it, and KJ and I will watch. I'll pray about it. You guys can judge. Oh, thank you. No, about whether or not I should compete. Oh, okay. I'm not going to pray for you. I can't just be my wasting thanks. prayers like that. I, I only get so many a year. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I only get so many. So then, is it sweet? Is yours sweet, though? It says you're not spicy, but is oh, it sweet at all? Um, honestly, the only way I can think of describe it is very well balanced. Okay. I don't think it's like... And not in a way that makes it plain. Like, I feel like I can tell that they're both there, but it's just that. Like, I think <laughs> if you picture the sweet and spicy, it's, I think it's a very, it balances appropriately between the two. Not just a clever name. Okay. And then original tastes pretty original. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely corn. Uh, so the, the soy sauce powder is in there, and I feel like there is kind of that rich, savory flavor, but only in 
in the pocket. So you only really get it as an aftertaste. So the more you eat of these, the more it kind of builds up. You're like, oh, this is weirdly savory and not, uh, it doesn't have that like kind of sweetness that a bugle might have that like kind of coats it, you know, and like keeps going back for more. Yeah. So this actually, that kind of savory aftertaste is kind of turning me off from it, but also the pop is so satisfying that I just keep eating it. So. I, I agree. I think they're, they're on to that popping part. It definitely pops more than uh, bugles, but um, yeah, they're definitely small. Which by pop, we should probably use the American lingo of crunch. 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 Yeah. <laughs> That's a really satisfying <clears throat> crunch. It's not like Pop Rocks. I don't know if I would eat Pop Rocks that taste like this. Um, what does yours taste like, Nathan? Does it taste like real corn? No. It tastes like a corn chip. <laughs> I mean, again, I can't compare because I haven't had the original or the sweet and spicy. It just, to me, it tastes like a, it does taste like a bugle, I feel like you were saying, a kind of adjacent bugle-ish. Mm. Um, but it just, yeah, it tastes like a plain corn chip. I wouldn't say it's overly corny which actually I was a little worried about because as I was mentioning ah. earlier, I've had a lot of- So it's not Asian... like you at all. Yeah. <laughs> Overly corny. <laughs> Definitely not. That's fired. <laughs> I'll take Nathan, that. That's his, that's his opinion, not mine. <laughs> but a lot of Asian corn snacks, I feel are, are a different type of corn. I don't know why. It's not like a tortilla chip or a Frito. It's like a sweeter powdery corn, I think. And I don't mm. know, it's- I feel like it's too artificially corn sometimes. This one actually is not. This one actually tastes like just a good corn chip. So mm. uh, I, I am pleasantly surprised and, and I like it. So, All right, let's go through and give it a rating. Um, Patrick, you want to kick us off? I feel like what Nathan just said is a really good descriptor. Uh, just a good corn chip. And I don't mean that in a derogatory. I would give these a solid four out of five. I don't know what they could do to better um, make it a five because these are very enjoyable. And as we have now established, I've already eaten one ba whole bag um, prior to this. So obviously they're good. Usually I have a lot of things to say about the package, which I think may have pushed it to a five. But I don't really have anything today. I agree. I would. I actually would give it a little bit higher. I'll give it a four and a half out of five just because wow, it's okay. not overly salty. Which I know you think I love salt, but I actually love like well-balanced chips and crackers and stuff. I feel <laughs> you this don't have to lie really on the podcast, Nathan. <laughs> this is safe space, minus my extreme chagrin of your sense of humor. Apparently, <laughs> I just don't want my health insurance to be watching the show and increase my premium. So <laughs> I like a decent amount of salt, an average amount that most humans my stature should have. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to come in with a hot take. I'm going to give this a two out of five. Whoa! Oh. Dude! And, and I say that having munched on these all episode. Whoa. Um, I don't, like, here's the deal. I can't stop, and I, but I think that that's more my own issue with eating food than it is the goodness of this pup and corn chip. Maybe okay, their other okay. flavors are better, but um, the thing that's nice, uh, I like the design of the chip itself. Um, it's like a a tortilla chip that was shrunk, but also has a big air pocket. So it's like really nice to eat. I like that I could open it right where it says open, no hassle. I did not like the smell that I was immediately assaulted by. of just kind of like the, all of that. Like it didn't get me excited. Like, by. look, when you open like a bag, like a family size bag of Doritos and you get assaulted by that nacho cheese smell, because obviously that's the only flavor that you're going to buy. Um, it's real good. It's, it's really exciting. You know, this one, not that great. Uh, I don't like that savory aftertaste that builds up in my mouth. And then I just feel like I'm exhaling savory aftertaste. And then like if it hits like the back of my tongue in a certain way, then like there's a new flavor I don't know how to identify. So yeah, I don't know. It's it's okay. I really like the texture of it, but uh, I don't know that I would like recommend it. But if somebody offered it to me, I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll have some. So, so two, two. two. I will say my initial surprise at your rating was honestly i it, yeah, i think it makes sense because if, if you rewind and go back you were liked a lot and then you did bring up the savoriness of it and mm -hmm. that was i feel like when it started to go down and then your mm -hmm. explanation there is like okay that makes sense so i'll give you that not the doritos mm -hmm. thing not the doritos thing but I will always give you that. the doritos thing. no <laughs> would it would you give it a higher rating if you could eat it off your fingers <laughs> 
Um... <laughs> okay. No. I thought for sure you had some. I thought for sure. It was I didn't a know like that. Question. I did not either. And that for the people listening hilarious. to the podcast, well, you're just going to have to go to YouTube to see that. Sorry. Yep. That was incredible. <laughs> Truly. Wow. All right. Um, so I thank you for me. listening to the show. You can find us everywhere at John Chi Show. Send us an email. Uh, John Chi Show, just like media.com. Unless you're Jerry. Jerry, your emails don't count. Um, <laughs> Especially when they're blank. You can find me. At... <laughs> yeah, you he didn't even us look at right. anything. He sent us one with <laughs> said, a subject and count? no content. I said, it doesn't even have to be a subject. And just say, hey, Patrick, in the email. And he, whatever. Anyways. <laughs> he didn't even do that. Jerry. You can find me at KJ Relke on all the places that I want to be found on the internet. Find me Nowak Photo and Nathan Nowak Photography. Or Nowak, depending. <laughs> depending. It's spelled the same, it. but it feels so different. <laughs> That's a whole topic in itself. Uh, you can find me at Patrick and the World on Instagram and. Yep. Boom. And if you are listening to this within the week it was released, we are going to be doing a live stream Ooh, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. for our next episode. So we are super excited. Follow us on Facebook if you don't already um, and join us for the live stream. We would love to hang out with you there. We've got some exciting news. We're going to do a look back on the past, like, what is this, two and a half, three months that we've been doing this because honestly, a lot has changed in the world and in us. Uh, so it'll be good just to hang out and interact with everyone. Uh, so please check us out on Facebook and uh, turn on your notifications so that you know when we go live. Bring some snacks, bring some drinks. Yeah, it'll be a true John Chi. An absolute John Chi. And uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed uh, this episode. We really enjoyed speaking with uh, with Tay and, and uh, Nuri. So yeah, thank you again and catch our live stream. Yeah, John Chi, hey And... Uh-